All right. Ujama. Ujama. I want to jama with you. All right. <laughs> okay. Welcome, fam. We're reading Nieres Ujama. I know most of you who are going to catch it live are going to miss the first 10 seconds, but that's fine. Um, I know I'm kind of late. I uh, decided to do some stuff this morning, but uh, it is what it is. We're going to start off with some Niere. I'm going to try to rush through this so I can get some breakfast um, and all that jazz. It's the first essay. So tomorrow is actually kind of long, but, oh, well, not tomorrow. I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow, but uh, this one's like 12 pages, but you know how pages are going uh, when we read it. I'm not going to read this preface. Oh, the preface is pretty short, but I'm still not going to read it. Um, and here's Ujama, right? Um, the basis of African socialism. So let's go. Socialism, like democracy, is an attitude of mind. Uh, by the way, this looks kind of small, right? So hold on a second. Let me just zoom in. Uh, let's see, press the zoom in button. Uh, let's zoom in a little more. A nice percentage, like 200%. Good. All right. Socialism, like democracy, is an attitude of mind. In a socialist society, it is the socialist attitude of mind and not the rigid adherence to a standard political pattern which is needed to ensure that the people care for each other's welfare. The purpose of this paper is to examine that attitude. It is not intended to define the institutions which may be required to embody it in a modern society. So this is not going to be one of those um, defining institutions things. It's, it's going to look at the attitude of the socialists, which is uh, a really important question. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, in the individual, as in the society, it is an attitude of mind which distinguishes the socialist from the non-socialist. It has nothing to do with the possession or non-possession of wealth. Destitute people can be potentially capitalists, exploiters of their fellow human beings. A millionaire can equally well be a socialist. He may value his wealth only because it can be used in the service of his fellow men. But the man who uses wealth for the purpose of dominating any of his fellows is a capitalist. So is the man who would if he could so this is interesting it's like usually um so this is a this is an interesting way uh usually you would look at the class divide based off of their possession of wealth so basically the proletariat is somebody who doesn't own the means of production and the capitalist is somebody who owns the means of production and what Nieta is introducing here or, or or suggesting here is this idea that it's realistically the mindset of a person Right. Another thing I want to point out is that, you know, millionaire was once considered wealthy, but now billionaire is like the new millionaire. You know, that's how either inflation goes or how, you know, how capitalism has advanced. But uh, what I would say is, yeah, that's a that's a pretty like I I usually I would go by saying, hey, you know, black folk aren't capitalists because they don't own capital. But, you know, I can also see how he says, hey, we do have the like we could we could say we're capitalistic, you know. Uh, or socialistic, um, i.e., you know, the mindset of capitalists or the mindset of socialists. But it's the same to say this because the other one is just as ridiculous. You know, capitalistic, socialistic, if you don't have capital, you know what I mean? Uh, but let's keep going. Have said, I have said that a millionaire can be a good socialist, but a socialist millionaire is a rare phenomenon. Indeed, he is almost a contradiction in terms. The appearance of millionaires in any society is no proof of its affluence. They can be produced by very poor countries like Tanganyika, just as well as by rich countries like the United States of America. For it is not an efficiency of production, nor the amount of wealth in a country which makes millionaires. It is the uneven distribution of what is produced. The basic difference between a socialistic a socialist society and a capitalist society does not lie in their methods of producing wealth, but in the way the wealth is distributed. While, therefore, a millionaire can be a good socialist, he could hardly be the product of a socialist society. So uh, that's already one of the things you want to pick up on, the idea that the socialist society uh, would not have a millionaire, um, per se. Uh, let's go back to it. Um, since the appearance of millionaires in a society does not depend on its affluence, sociologists may find it interesting to try and find out why our societies in Africa did not in fact produce any millionaires, for we certainly had enough wealth to create a few. Um, now, I wouldn't say that our societies didn't produce millionaires because, 
you know, some people would allege the richest person on the planet was um, this uh, Mansa Musa, you know? And so, like, there were a lot of really wealthy individuals um, in Africa. Uh, now, whether you consider them millionaires by American currency, um, that wasn't even, like, when, before America even existed is a, another question, but I wouldn't say that it didn't produce incredibly wealthy individuals uh, because a lot of times, and that's the thing that I, I want us to really grasp as a people is that a lot of times we did have incredibly wealthy individuals. Um, uh, you know, the question of, yeah, the question of whether or not they were millionaires, you know, kind of like, is like a retroactive, you know, application in the sense that like, you know, depending on the economy, right? You know, like, let's say if you're a hunter gatherer who owns like everything, are you a millionaire? You know what I mean? <laughs> are you, you know, are you a millionaire? Like you might have all the wealth in the community per se, but are you a millionaire? Uh, that's the uh, that's the big question. Or or if you like, let's say if you're an indiv individual who owns, who actually owns other individuals, right? Or you own a, a bevy of of like you own like ten thousand cows, you know? Uh, like in modern parlance, a cow could sell for a thousand dollars, but let's say you have ten thousand high quality cows that sell for even more than that, you know, two thousand dollars or whatever, twenty thousand dollars. Who cares, right? Point is, are you a millionaire or are you just a guy with ten thousand cows? You know what I mean? Uh, or your guy with a hundred thousand cows, like a uh, hundred thousand cows and fifty thousand people, you know, uh, we're the we're the kings of 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 Europe, millionaires. That's the question. Um, so anyway, so he says uh, sociologists uh, may find it interesting to try and find out why our societies in Africa did not, in fact, produce any millionaires. For we certainly had enough wealth to create a few. I think they would discover that it was because the organization of traditional African society and distribution of the wealth is produced was such that there was hardly any room for parasitism. They might also say, of course, that as a result of this, Africa could not produce a leisured class of landowners, and therefore there was nobody to produce the works of art or science which capitalist societies can boast. But works of art and the achievements of science are products of the intellect, which, like land, is one of God's gifts to man. And I cannot believe that... Okay, I should stop using this word. Um, let's say Amon. Amon is so careless as to have made the use of his, of one of his gifts depend on the misuse of another. Um, so, yeah, so like I said, the, the leisure class thing, I think that was a thing. Uh, particularly if you go to Egypt, um, obviously... There's not too much, too many records of people um, between that time, but that's um, that's another thing. Uh, defenders of capitalism claim that the millionaire's wealth is the just reward for his ability of, or enterprise, but this claim is not borne out by the facts. The wealth of the millionaire depends a little on the enterprise or abilities of the millionaire himself, as the power of a feudal monarch depended on his own efforts, enterprise, or brain. Both are users, exploiters of the abilities and enterprise of other people. Even when you have an exceptionally intelligent and hardworking millionaire, the difference between his intelligence and his enterprise, his hard work, and those of other members of society cannot possibly be proportionate to the difference between their rewards. There must be something wrong in a society where one man, however hardworking or clever he may be, can acquire as great a reward as a thousand of his fellows can acquire between them. Uh, okay, so... So, so my thing is this. I, I do, you know, I, I appreciate Niere. Niere is one of the greatest um, of our ancestors, uh, especially in the 20th century, right? What I would say is this. Um, I, think, I think leadership does um, warrant, like it does warrant reward, does warrant praise. Kind of the same as I'm like, hey, Niere is so great, Niere is so great, you know? Uh, and I'm saying that not because he was the greatest person of his generation but because he was a leader you know and the leader i feel does get you know more rewards for just leading the enterprise because the reality is that two people leading the same enterprise can cause drastically different effects you know and what we see in africa now is a need for people like a need for leadership like niere and it's the same with a business i believe that you would have a need for a person like, um, I mean, obviously, like like Niere in a sense. You you would want a, a, a nice, intelligent, you know, individual uh, 
hardworking, intelligent, all that kind of stuff, and and for the for the people or for the objective. Uh, but yes, I I believe that you should reward people um, on that basis alone. But it is what it is. Let's see. Acquisitiveness for the purpose of gaining power and prestige is unsocialist. So I, I noticed that they use the word acquisitive a lot. Um, I don't. I never use that word, but. Acquisitive, basically acquiring things for the purpose of gaining power and prestige is unsocialist. It is a acquisitive society. Wealth tends to corrupt those who possess it. It tends to breed in them a desire to live more comfortably than their fellows, to dress better in every way to outdo them. They begin to feel they must climb as far above their neighbors as they can. The visible contrast between their own comfort and the comparative discomfort of the rest of society becomes almost essential to the enjoyment of their wealth. And this sets off the spiral of personal competition, which is from which is then antisocial so i mean i don't know to what extent this is um this luxury um you know luxury and debasement of other people is a is a is a necessity but that's something that you want to focus on too because that is the more extreme end um that that you do want to reject as a people right um you know this idea of oh well if other people are suffering then i'm going to feel better you know i guess the germans call it schadenfreude um, anyhow, uh, still, still no comments, but it is what it is, right? Apart from the antisocial effects of the accumulation of personal wealth, the very desire to accumulate it must be interpreted as a vote of no confidence in the social system. For when a society is so organized that it cares about its individuals, then provided he is willing to work, no individual within that society should worry about what will happen to him tomorrow if he does not hoard wealth today. Society itself should look after him or his widow or his orphans. This is exactly what traditional African society succeeded in doing. Both the rich and the poor individuals were completely insecure in African society. Natural catastrophe brought famine, but it brought famine to everybody, poor or rich. Nobody starved, either of food or of human dignity, because he lacked personal wealth. He could depend on the wealth possessed by the community of which he was a member. That was socialism. That is socialism. There can be no such thing as acquisitive socialism, for that would be another contradiction in terms. Socialism is essentially distributive. It concerns its concern is to see those that those who sow reap a fair share of what they sow. So again, I I uh, I would look at this. Um, yeah. All right. So. Again, I would say that this is the product of an agrarian society. And 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 so whereas it is a form of socialism um, in the sense of, you know, if you were to look at the from a Marxian point of view, you know, of, you know, this primitive socialism, they call it. But basically the first socialism, uh, which is the agrarian society. And in the agrarian society, before you sell the produce, yes, the, everything it should be used for your consumption. Right. Um, but then when you sell the produce to another, like to a town, right? How does the town distribute the food is the question. Because what happens in the agrarian society is that people are working for the food. In the town, they're not. And so that's partly why you want to um, organize economies in that way. And I think, I think what happens later in, um, that's why Nyerere is so good, by the way. But what happens later in Nyerere's life is... Um, he he goes back and says that he might have been a little bit wrong on his uh, bureaucracies uh, when it came to implementing socialism. You know, he's so good. Um, you know, and and that's that's something that you know I wouldn't take lightly. You know, like 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 um, I wouldn't take that lightly. But anyhow, let's see. Uh, okay, no comments again. Let's go. The production of wealth, whether by primitive or modern methods, requires three things. First, land. Um, you know, the nature has given us the land, and it is from the land that we get the raw materials which we reshape to meet our needs. Now, again, this 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 religious thing that you know land was given to us, uh, like it's it's a nice justification, um, but it's not um, like it's not reality. I don't think land was given to us. Um, I mean, obviously, we we should use the land. But I don't think it was given to us as human beings, in a sense, exclusively. Uh, although he doesn't say exclusively here, but, you know, that's that's one of the implications in the religious mindset, particularly. 
the Abrahamic we religious mindset. But anyway, has given us the land, and it's from the land that we get the raw materials which we reshape to meet our needs. Secondly, tools. And tools are very important. We have found by simple experience that tools do help. So we make the hoe, the axe, or the modern factory or tractor to help us produce wealth, the goods we need. And thirdly, human exertion or labor. We don't need to read Karl Marx or Adam Smith to find out that neither the land nor the hoe actually produces wealth. And we don't need to take degrees in economics to know that neither the worker nor the landlord produces land. Land is uh, Amon's gift to man. It is always there. But we do know, still, without degrees in economics, that the axe and the plow were produced by the laborer. Some of our most sophisticated friends apparently have to undergo the most rigorous intellectual training simply in order to discover that stone axes were produced by that ancient gentleman, early man, to make it easier for him to skin the impala he had just killed with a club, which he had also made for himself. In traditional African society, everybody was a worker. There was no other way of earning a living for the community. Even the elder who appeared to be enjoying himself without doing any work and for whom everybody else appeared to be working had in fact worked hard all his younger days. The wealth he now appeared to possess was not his personally. It was only his as the elder of the group which he had produced it. He was its guardian. The wealth, so that's the leisure class right there itself gave him neither power nor prestige the respect paid to him by the young was his because he was older than they and had served his community longer and the poor elder enjoyed as much respect in our society as the rich elder um that's a thing too uh somewhat you know um i would say i mean again i like it could be particular to where he was but i i know that uh you know you could have an elder above of other elders um all right so when I say that in traditional African society, everybody was a worker, I do not use the word worker simply as opposed to employer, but also as opposed to loiterer or idler. Um, yeah, so, so the, you know, yeah. One of the most socialistic achievements of our society was the sense of security it gave to its members and the universal hospitality on which they could rely. But it is too often forgotten nowadays that the basis of this great socialistic achievement was this, that it was taken for granted that every member of society, barring only the children and the infirm, contributed its fair share of effort towards the production of its wealth. Not only was the capitalist or the landed exploiter unknown to traditional African society, but we did not have the other form of modern parasite, the loiterer or idler, who accepts the hospitality of society as his right, but gives nothing in return. Capitalistic exploitation was impossible. Loitering was an unthinkable disgrace. I should say this, though. I want to say this, though. I want to say this because I want you guys to look at this um, video I produced um, called, like, like there's no such thing as African culture or something like that, right? Um, in it, I, I examine... Um, uh, not a not it's not an agrarian people but it's uh like the uh the nomadic people i can't remember their name but the, they're the ones with the red ochre that they put on their bodies um they like their form of labor is very idle you know and the thing is that even when it comes to farming although there's a intense planting season there's also a lot of idle uh, in comparison to the industrial economy, which requires daily, um, like daily labor, you know, uh, so that's just another thing to, 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 to consider when we, when we compare different economies with different economies, um, that, that even if you were like involved in the agrarian process, the reality is that you cannot do the same thing every day, all year round in an agrarian economy, because clearly like, you know, you're responding to the, like, you're working with the land, and the land does not work 24-7. Uh, those of us who talk about the African way of life, and quite right, rightly, take a pride in maintaining the traditional, the tradition of hospitality, which is so great a part of it, might do well to remember the Swahili saying, Ungeni siku mbili, siku ya tatu mpe jembe, or in English, treat your guests as a guest for two days, 
And on the third day, give him a hoe. I remember that one. <laughs> In actual fact, the guest was likely to ask for the hoe even before his host had to give him one, for he knew what was expected of him and would have been ashamed to remain idle any longer. Thus, working was part and parcel, was indeed the very basis and justification of this socialist achievement of which we are so justly proud. There is no such thing as socialism without work. A uh, society which fails to give its individuals the means to work or having given them the means to work prevents them from getting a fair share of the products of their own sweat and toil needs putting right. Similarly, an individual who can work and is provided by society with the means to work but does not do so is equally wrong. He has no right to expect anything from society because he contributes nothing to society. And this is a, a quotable right here. He has no right to expect anything from society because he contributes nothing to society, right? The other use of the word worker as a, spe a specialized sense of employee as opposed to employer reflects a capitalistic attitude of mind which was introduced into Africa with the coming of colonialism and it's totally foreign to our own way of thinking. In the old days, the African had never aspired to the possession of personal wealth for the purpose of dominating any of his fellows. Uh, see, that's what I'm saying. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go by, I wouldn't say this, you know? Like, again, it depends on the economy, but a lot of times you did have servants. Now, it could be um, in relation to um, Islam, Islam's introduction, but you did have um, slavery in, 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 early, in, in some parts of Africa, right? Uh, possibly not where Nyerere is from, obviously, but you did have this, right? He had never had laborers or factory hands to do the work for him. But then came the foreign capitalists. They were wealthy, they were powerful, and the African naturally started wanting to be wealthy too. There's nothing wrong in our wanting to be wealthy, nor is it a bad thing for us to want to acquire the power which wealthy, with wealth brings with it. But it most certainly is wrong if we want the wealth and the power so that we can dominate somebody else. Unfortunately, there are some of us who have already learned to covet wealth for that purpose and who would like to use the method which the capitalist uses in acquiring it. That is to say, some of us would like to use or exploit our brothers for the purpose of building up our own personal power and prestige. This is completely foreign to us and it is incompatible with the socialist society we want to build here. Now, I want you to focus on this, how he says, our brothers. You know, Nyerere, say what you will. This is a man who loves our people. Okay, this is a man who loves our people, just how he talks about us. See, the way how we tend, even me, even myself, the way how even like people in the comments, although there's nobody in the comments, so it doesn't matter. But even people like me, um, like I used to say brothers a lot, I'm like, oh, it's our brothers and sisters. But like the longer I've been on Twitter and all that kind of stuff, the longer I've just been other Africans or African Americans or or, or this and that, so on and so forth, right? You know, African Americans or Nigerians or this and that, you know, a Scotty, blah, 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 right? Uh, he's calling, at, he's like our brothers, you know? Like he's so, this is such, this is like, if nothing else, you can learn about love from this man. This is, this is like, this is impressive. Like just even how he, his, his diction, his personal choice of how he addresses his fellow Africans is 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 above and beyond what you can expect. Uh, I don't even know if there's anything like like yeah. This is this is this is this is nice. This is nice. All right. So our first step, therefore, must be to re-educate ourselves to regain our former attitude of. Let me just check it Our former attitude of mind in our traditional African society, we were individuals within a community, right? Uh, we took care of the community, and the community took care of us. We neither needed nor wished to exploit our fellow men. And in rejecting the capitalist attitude of mind which colonialism brought into Africa, we must reject also the capitalist method which go with it. One of these is the individual ownership of land. To us in Africa, land was always recognized as belonging to the community. Each individual within our society had a right to the use of land because otherwise he would not earn his living and one cannot have the right to life without also having the right to some means of maintaining life. But the African's right to land was simply the right to use it. He had no other right to it, nor did it occur to him to try and claim one. So again, this is like the agrarian thing. The foreigner introduced a completely different concept, the concept of land as a marketable commodity. According to the system, a person could claim a piece of land as his own private property, whether he intended to use it or not. I could take a few square miles of land, call them mine, and then go off to the moon. 
All I had to do to gain a living from my land was to charge a rent to the people who wanted to use it. If this piece of land was in an urban area, I had no need to develop it at all. I could leave it to the fools who were prepared to developing. Yeah, I could leave it to the fools who were prepared to develop all the other pieces of land surrounding my piece and in do doing so automatically to raise the market of value of mine. Then I could come down from the moon and demand that these fools pay me through their noses for the high value of my land, a value which they themselves had created for me while I was enjoying myself on the moon. Such a system is not only foreign to us, it is completely wrong. Landlords in a society which recognizes individual ownership of land can be, and usually are, in the same class as the loiterers I was talking about, the class of parasites. So, yeah, this is pretty interesting. So, yeah, the, the individual ownership of land, particularly of the town versus the, uh, of the, uh, the, 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 the country or whatever, right, is probably a, a distinct difference. Um, uh, not to say that they didn't have this in Africa, because obviously there were a lot of towns in Africa, um, but this is probably like the crux of capitalism, really. You know, the fact that uh, people can uh, individually own land and charge rent, but there's a reason for it. I would say, um, but I mean, I, I, I could see how that's um, uh, dismissive. I, mean, I can see how people are dismissive of that. Um, so anyway, we must not allow the growth of parasites here in Tanganyika. So no, notice that he says Tanganyika. Y'all see that? So basically, this is the man who will change this country into Tanzania, you know? Uh, but like at this time, it wasn't Tanzania. He, he, this is like a, his, this is a, this is a historic legend. You know, I know I'm like over fawning, but, you know, uh, like this is a historic legend. So the Tanu government must go back to the traditional African custom of land holding. That is to say, a member of society will be entitled to a piece of land on condition that he uses it. Unconditional or freehold ownership of land. Oh, speaking of which, what's interesting is this. I started reading uh, Adam Smith again. I'm like halfway through now. That's a 1200 page book. So bear in mind that. But. Uh, he does talk about how in early America they would claim, like the, the white Americans obviously, would claim a bunch of land, but if they did not develop it, then the state would take it back. Like if they couldn't develop all of it, then the state would take back what they couldn't develop, you know? Um, something like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, uh, but of course they still, in America, they still own the land. Um, so anyway, that is to say, a member of society will be entitled to a piece of land on condition that he uses it. Unconditional or freehold ownership of land, which leads to speculation and parasitism, must be abolished. We must, as I have said, regain our former attitude of mind, our traditional African socialism, and apply it to the new societies we are building today. Tanu has pledged itself to make socialism the basis of its policy in every field. The people of Tanganyika have given us their mandate to carry out that policy by electing a Tanu government to lead them. So the government can be relied upon to introduce only legislation which is in harmony with socialist policy principles. But as I have said at the beginning, true socialism is an attitude of mind. It is therefore up to the people of Tanganyika, the peasants, the wage earners, the students, and the leaders, uh, is all of us, to make sure that this socialist attitude of mind is not lost through the temptation to personal gain or the abuse of position of authority, which may come our way as individuals, or through the temptation to look on the good of the whole community as a secondary importance to the interests of our own particular group. Just to, and see, that's the end of tribalism right there. Some brother asked yesterday, you see how I said brother, I decided to do that, right? Some brother asked this yesterday, um, how do you get rid of tribalism? And he's like, look, we're going to create a new mindset. And, and this is what Tanzania does. It, it, it does create a, like, it does, like, eradicate, essentially, like, like, get rid of tribalism in Africa, more or less, right? Where you ask somebody, hey, wh what are you? And they're like, I'm Kenyan. No, I'm Tanzanian, sorry. <laughs> I'm Tanzanian. And then it's like, oh, what's your tribe? And they're like, what? Oh, yeah, I guess I'm Jube or something. I don't know. Right? You know what I mean? But, uh, but like, he's like, yeah, like, you're going to put the good of the whole community, the good of Tanzania is going to be... Of, of more importance than your particular, you know, oh, I'm Jube, you know what I mean? Uh, just as the elder in our former society was respected for his age and his service to the community, so in our modern society, this respect for age and service will be preserved. All, and in the same way as the rich elder, as apparent wealth was really only held by him in trust of his people, so today the apparent extra wealth which certain positions of leadership may bring to the individuals who fill them can be theirs only insofar as it's necessary aid to the carrying out of their duties. It is a tool entrusted to them for the benefit of the people they serve. It is not theirs. 
personally, and they may not use any part of it as a means of accumulating more for their own benefit, nor as an insurance against the day when they no longer hold the same positions. They would be That would be to betray the people who entrusted it to them. If they serve the community while they can, the community must look after them when they are no longer able to do so. Um, so that's an interesting um, mindset, you know? Uh, I mean, again, like, if you can do it, like, why not? You know, humans can organize however they want, you know? If they want to organize in this way, then then that's it. Tanzan is here. She says greetings to Oni. Um, so greetings, Tanzan. We're talking about Tan right now. Tanganyika. So appreciate you coming by. Um, in tribal society, the individuals of the family within the tribe were rich or poor according to whether the whole tribe was rich or poor. If the tribe prospered, all the members of the tribe shared its in its prosperity. Tanganyika today is a poor country. The standard of living of the masses of our people is shamefully low. But if every man and woman in the country takes up the challenge and works to the limit of his or her ability for the good of the whole society, Tanganyika will prosper, and that prosperity will be shared by all her people. But it must, and you see how he says all her people. This is again, he's he's and he's serious. He's serious. It, it, this is how you get rid of um, like ethnic division in the country. But it must be shared. The true socialist may not exploit his fellows. So that if the members of any group within our society are going to argue that because they happen to be contributing more to the national income than some other group, they must therefore take for themselves a greater share of the profit of their own industry than they actually need. Wait, hold on a second. The true sh so, so that if the members of any group within our society are going to argue that because they happen to be contributing more to the national income than some other groups, they must therefore take for themselves a greater share of the profits of their own industry than they actually need, and if they insist on this in spite of the fact that it would mean reducing their group's contribution to the general income and thus slowing down the rate of which the whole community can benefit, then that group is exploiting or trying to exploit its fellow human beings and is playing a capitalist attitude of mind. So that's that's a really interesting um, insurance against, uh, let's say, wealth accumulation. Now, of course, I it's a, it's a complicated question, uh, but I mean, it, it's an attitude. Like if you if you want to do it, go for it. You know, they are bound to be certain groups which, by virtue of the market value of their particular industry's products, will contribute more to the nation's income than others. While the others may actually be producing goods or services which are of equal or greater intrinsic value, although they do not happen to command such an art high artificial value. For example, the food produced by the peasant farmer is of greater social value than the diamonds mined at Muadu. But the mine workers of Madu could claim, quite correctly, that their labor was yielding greater financial profits to the community than that of the farmers. If, however, they went on to demand that they should, therefore, be given most of the extra profits for themselves, and that no share of it should be spent on helping the farmers, that would be, they'd be potential capitalists. So this is actually interesting, um, this is like an interesting question. So this actually does address the the question of um, of distribution and so on and so forth essentially if i go and risk my life in the mines i go do hard labor in the mines should i not be paid more right than the farmer who's just grazing their land you know um it does beg the question of why would i go into the mines risk my life in the mines if i could live comfortably and have the same sort of um lifestyle in the a farm with, if I'm not getting any additional reward. Um, now, now that's the, the question. Now, to what extent do I get an additional reward? And if there's no extent that I get an additional reward, then again, how do you, um, like, how is this regulated? So that's something that I would definitely like to um, see explored. And of course, um, if it's not explored, you know, I do welcome people in the chat to... Um, or the person in the chat, <laughs> uh, Dan Zan, right, to, uh, you know, address and answer that question. So this is exactly where the attitude of mind comes in. It is one of the purposes of trade unions to ensure for the worker a fair share of the profits of their labor, but a fair share must be fair in relation to the whole society. If it is greater than the country can afford without having to penalize some other section of society, then it is not a fair share. Trade union leaders and their followers, as long as they are true socialists, will not, not need to be coerced by the government into keeping their demands within their limits imposed by the need of society as a whole. Only if there are potential capitalists amongst them will the socialist government have to step in and prevent them from putting their capitalist ideas into practice. As with groups, so with individuals. 
There are certain skills, certain qualifications, which for good reasons command a high rate of salary for their possessors than others. But here again, the true socialist will demand only that return of his skilled work, which he knows to be a fair one in proportion to the wealth or poverty of the whole society to which he belongs. He will not, unless he is a would-be capitalist, attempt to blackmail the community by demanding a salary equal to that paid to his counterparts in some far wealthier society. So, so it looks like he is saying... Um, that there is a pay differential, okay? So that, you know, like, say, a professor would get paid more than a junior professor or a professor would be more paid than a teacher or whatever, right? He's saying there's a pay, there's a pay differential. It's just not going to be as great a pay differential or you won't necessarily demand to be paid like an American, um, which is interesting. Uh, right now in Ghana, I know that, like, I, I knew this professor in Ghana and she was not getting paid um, that much money. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know how happy she was with it, but, <laughs> but she wasn't getting paid that much money. Uh, European socialism was born of the agrarian revolution and the industrial revolution which followed it. The former created the landed and the landless classes of the society. The latter produced the modern capitalists and the industrial proletariat. So there you go, the landed and landless, yeah. Uh, these two revolutions planted the seeds of conflict within society, and not only was European socialism born of that conflict, but its apostles sanctified the conflict itself into a philosophy. Civil war was no longer looked upon as something evil or something unfortunate, but as something good and necessary. Uh, as prayer is to Christianity or to Islam, so civil war, which they call class war, is to the European version of socialism, a means inseparable from the end. Each becomes the basis of a whole way of life. The European socialist cannot think of his socialism without its father, capitalism. He's right. Brought up in tribal socialism, so that's the primitive socialism. I'm, oh, no, so no, sorry, that's not primitive That's his, what he's saying. He has his own type of socialism. Brought up in tribal socialism, I must say, I find this contradiction quite intolerable. It gives capitalism a philosophical status, which capitalism neither claims nor deserves. For its virtue says, virtually says, without capitalism and the conflict which capitalism creates with society, there can be no socialism. And that's true. That's true. That's the thing that a lot of us do not realize is that when you when you oh, I don't like capitalism, I don't like capitalism. Like realistically, capitalism creates the the society which fosters this quote unquote scientific socialism, right? So this glorification of capitalism by the doctrinaire European socialists, I repeat, I find intolerable. African socialism, on the other hand, did not have the benefit of the agrarian revolution or the industrial revolution. It did not start from the existence of conflicting classes in society. Indeed, I doubt if the equivalent for the word class exists in any indigenous African language, for language describes the ideas of those who speak it, and the idea of the class of caste was not existent in African society. Now, again, I would not say that, right? I mean, again, unless you exclude the Islamicized, uh, but again, I would say that in early, early Africa, in ancient Africa, you would see um, class division, right? Like a lot of a lot of parts of the planet, you would see class division. Maybe not necessarily class conflict, but you would see class division. Um, the foundation of the uh, wait, what? This is already it's already over. What? I thought it was up page seventeen, but okay, that's cool. So the foundation on the objective of African socialism is the extended family. The foundation and the objective of African socialism is the extended family. The true African socialist does not look for, look on one class of men as his brethren and another as his natural enemy. He does not form an alliance with the brethren for the extermination of the non-brethren. He rather regards all men as his brethren. And that's what I'm saying. You see that? Like, even I'm a little bit more antagonistic. I'll tell you guys the truth. So I, I go about and I say, those are the fucking Ascotti. You understand? And these are the Oncobia, you know, you know what I mean? I even I do that. But what 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 Anietta is saying is um, like, no, those are everybody's your brother. You know what I mean? Everybody's your brother. Now, I don't know if I would take that, but that's like, you know, that's beautiful. Uh, Tanzan says, I'm sorry, but I like to start at the start. I'm shaking my damn head, Tanzan. No, I feel you. This is a this is a book anyway. Um, uh it's all good. Let me write down Shake It. S M D D H. Let me just write down S M D H for her. S M D H. Oh, shit. I didn't put the H. <laughs> shit. Okay, that's a. Well, those of you, well hopefully she doesn't know what S M D is. <laughs> Wait, actually, I can't I can, I can even delete it now. It's, it's like a live chat. Anyway. All right, so. 
<laughs> he rather regards all uh, men as his brethren. <laughs> okay. Uh, he rather regards all men as his brethren, as members of his ever extending family. That is why the first article of Tanu's Creed is <laughs> Binadamu Wote ni Ndugu Zangu na Afrika ni Moja. All right. So let me see if I can actually, let me see if for a second. I don't know that. Wote, Undugu, probably brother, my brother, and then, and, or Africa, my Africa, you know? So I would say my Africa, or Africa is first, maybe? Yeah, Africa is first, maybe? Uh, and I, I'm partly looking at the bottom, but anyway, let's see. If this had been originally put in English, it would have been, I believe in human brotherhood and the unity of Africa. So I need to catch up, you know? But I guess that's Africa as one. Yeah, um, Moja. Yeah, Moja is like one. So anyway, um, uh, I know brother. Um, this is knee is is, um, Zango. I thought would be like ownership, but like usually I would look at it as Wangu and so on and so forth. But Zango might have like a different meaning. So the first article of Tano's Creed is, you know, I believe in human brotherhood and the unity of Africa, and he believes in it. Okay, Ujama then or familyhood that describes our socialism it is opposed to capitalism which seeks to build a happy society on the basis of exploitation of man by man and it is equally opposed to doctrinaire socialism which seeks to build its happy society on a philosophy of inevitable conflict between man and man we in africa have no more need of being converted to socialism than we have of being taught democracy both are rooted in our own past and the traditional society which produced us now i don't want us to keep claiming democracy another thing but that's for another time. Modern African socialism can draw from its traditional heritage the recognition of society as an extension of the basic human, the basic family unit. So let's, let me read this again. Modern African socialism can draw from its traditional heritage the recognition of society as an extension of the basic family unit. Modern African socialism can draw from its traditional heritage the recognition of of society society is the extension of the basic family unit that's how you would formulate african socialism but it can no longer confine the idea of the social family within the limits of the tribe nor indeed of the nation for no true african socialist can look at a line drawn on a map and say the people on this side of that line are my brothers but those who happen to live on the other side of it can have no claim on me every individual on this continent is his brother Look at that. Every individual on this continent is his brother. Um, now, hopefully, you know, this will be restricted to um, the African race. But, you know, eh, you know uh, we don't know. And hopefully it could extend beyond the continent. You know, and I think that's a case with Nyere. Although, you know, you'd want to say that. But either way. It was in the struggle to break the grip of colonialism that we learned the need for unity. We came to recognize that the same socialist attitude of mind which, in the tribal days, gave to every individual the security that comes of belonging to a widely extended family must be preserved within the still wider society of the nation. But we should not stop there. Our recognition of the family to which we all belong must be extended yet further, beyond the tribe, the community, the nation, or even the continent, to embrace the whole society of mankind. So that's where I was like, ah, oh, I, I was, I was afraid. I was scared. I was, I was afraid of that. This is the only logical conclusion for true socialism. So, yeah, that's what I was a little bit afraid of. But you know, still one of the, still one of the best. You know. Okay, so I don't know why Tanzan said yes. That's a. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> I'm sure there's another. I don't know what that means. All right. Anyway, fam. Uh, with that, obviously, that's the end of the podcast. And um, thank you everybody for coming through. Thanks, Tanzan. I know that there's three concurrent viewers. They said said I was at max four. So I appreciate everybody, even those who didn't say anything. Um, appreciate you guys. Uh, hopefully you'll join me. Maybe I don't know if it'll be tomorrow. I maybe possibly, but um, in all likelihood. Uh, but other than that, thank you so much, everybody. Shamiam Hotep. Anku Ja Seneb Neb. I mean, unless there's any questions. Amen. Ma'at Dua Nature. Peace.